When I watch a movie, I am in it, man. I am in it. If there's a scary part, uh, like a startling part, we don't, you know, watch crazy movies. But if there's a startling part, someone, someone walks in, I didn't expect them to, I will yell. Oh, yeah. uh, and it's kind of disturbing, like, to Shelly, <laughs> uh, frankly. But I, 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 there's one character that really stands out to me, and it's, I don't know if you're going to think this is a character, but it sort of, sort of seems like a character to me. There's one movie villain that it just bothers me so much. And for me, it symbolizes violent opposition to the good guys. And it is the shockwave driller worm machine in Transformers 3. Like this thing, it is a swirling robot of knives that are, they're literally, literally swirling. It can go through a, a skyscraper. It can go in the desert under the ground. It can fly in the air. And it, it just seems like there is nothing you can do to, to fight that thing or even for sure defeat it. And I really have a struggle uh, it, 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 when I see these um, alien things, you know, uh, in movies or th- things like that that are just indestructible machines because in my mind, I think, there's no way anyone can beat that. Like, come on. There's no, but I know, also, the other part of me knows, okay, the hero, he's going to find a way, you know, he's going to put the all spark at him or something. something. I mean, there's going to be something that's going to happen, and he'll be able to do it. But in, if that thing were in real life, and it were opposing us, there's nothing we can do. And today... I, that was sort of a silly intro to the topic of opposition. Today, I want to talk to you about making an impact despite opposition. Impact despite opposition. So would you turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 4? verses 1 to 31, the book of Acts. And we've been in Acts for a while now uh, in this series called Great Beginnings. And we're talking about the, 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 just the awesome beginning of the church, of the people who are, put their faith in Jesus and they're walking together as a community like us. But where we are now in the story, in the Great Beginnings, is that all of a sudden, the, the early church started facing opposition. See what I did there? It wasn't a shockwave driller worm, but it was a different kind of opposition they were facing. And this is, this is how it felt to them. Like, can you imagine if right now I was preaching and a U.S. marshal came in the back door and arrested me and put me in jail? Can you imagine how that would feel? That would be very scary. It would, it would be confusing. It would be, uh, you, would, you would all be thinking, am I next? What's going on? What's, you know, what's going to happen to Garen? It, it, it's a scary thing, but that is what happened in the early church. So uh, I'm just kind of continuing on just past the story we've talked about for the last couple of weeks where a, a man who had not been able to walk since he was born, he's 41 years old, he was healed through power in the name of Jesus. A crowd gathers. Peter starts, uh, one of the early apostles, starts preaching to the crowd, and it, it's going, it's amazing. There's been a healing. There's a crowd. He's telling them about Jesus. And in the midst of all that, the U.S. Marshal comes. Oh, it, wasn't, it, was in, it was in Israel, so I guess it wasn't the U.S. Marshal. But the high council, the national leaders there in the capital city of the nation, they came with the guards. And they confronted Peter as he was preaching. And they, they, they ended up taking Peter and John, two of the main leaders of the early church at this point, and they put him in a holding cell overnight, and they said, we will deal with you later. So they went from preaching and freedom to now they're in jail. Well, the next day, the high council called Peter and John in before them. So imagine it would feel like going before the Senate in our country. So already just walking in the room under good circumstances is scary and kind of intimidating. There, would be, there was a, a semicircle of, of all these leaders uh, uh, on this floor, and then they, they brought in Peter and John in front of them, and they brought the guy who had been healed. Wow. So this is really kind of an interesting thing because they brought Peter and John in for questioning. And they asked them two questions, basically where did you get the power to do this, to heal this person? Wow. 
And who sent you to do it? So why would they ask that? Why, why would that even matter? Well, because they were laying a little plan. And their plan was to try to trick Peter and John into saying something that they could use against them to say that, that, that they were worshiping a false god and teaching others to do so, or that they were operating this, like, this gift of healing uh, through witchcraft. Because if they said anything that sounded like that to them, then in the, in the law, they had a legal right to stone Peter and John. So that's why they said, you know, who sent you and whose authority do you come? And who gave you this power to do this? Are you conjuring up healings through some evil way? Well, Peter made it very clear to them, no, (laughs) Uh, who gave them the power and the authority to heal. And we talked about this last Sunday night in Together Night, so as we're going through Living Free, power and authority. Jesus has power and authority, and he delegates that power and authority to believers. It was one of of my favorite lessons in Living Free we've had so far. I came away with a whole list of declarations that I've been able to say over my life because I am walking in the power and authority that Jesus gave us. Amen? And uh, uh, Peter made it very clear. Our power and our authority come from Jesus Christ. They said, we did this in Jesus' name. And so I'm going to bring out several truths from this story, this Bible story, as we go on through the Bible and and read the rest of it. But let's jump down to verse 8. So Acts chapter 4, verses 8 to 10. Then Peter, in front of the Senate, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of our people. Now, just, just notice, that's a respectful thing to say. So they've been called in. Really, their rights are violated. But they, they've been called in, and they start respectfully. Rulers and elders, elders of our people, are we being questioned today because we've done a good deed for a crippled man? Like, do you see how crazy this is? Do you want to know how he was healed? Let me clearly state to all of you and to all the people of Israel, because they're in front of a national body. So they're saying, we're not only talking to you guys in the room, but this is a message for our nation to hear. This man was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, the man you crucified but whom God raised from the dead. So it's just been a a couple months since Jesus was crucified. So it's very fresh in everybody's mind. But they said, but God raised him from the dead. So here's the apostles. They're healing. They are preaching good news. They are helping people. And yet still the leaders opposed them. Now, we know at this time in history, because uh, uh, just the other details that are given there in Acts chapter 4, the leaders uh, of their senate, if you will, they were were kind of a a religious body that also uh, upheld the laws and made judgments. So there's really quite, it's like religion, um, Congress, and judicial, all in one group of people. So a very powerful group of people. The ones who were in charge were from a certain belief system. They were called Sadducees. And if you were a Sadducee, you would be sad, you see, because they don't believe in the resurrection. So they, not only do they not believe in Jesus' resurrection, they don't believe in resurrection, period. They believe this, the end of this life, that's it. And so here's Peter and John and the other apostles out there preaching that Jesus was raised from the dead, and if you put your faith in him, you will have eternal life also. This made them so mad at the leaders. So even though they were helping people, like this man could now walk and leap and praise God, still they disagreed with Peter's message. So you know what they shouted? This is what I think they shouted. Misinformation! (laughs) Subtle little subliminal message there. Because we know in our day and time now, if we say something that disagrees with the media person or the politician, whoever is talking about it, they say misinformation, and then they start stringing some other words along like terrorist, 
He's, he's uh, uh, on and on it goes. And that's basically the same feel that was going on here in this place. Misinformation. They, they, we disagree. Don't talk about resurrection because we don't believe in resurrection. So just like today, back then, if you express a, an opposing view, you come under attack. And so these leaders wanted to cancel Peter and John. We're just going to cancel you. And they, they were cooking up a plan to cancel them, like for, for, for serious. But either way, they, were, they violently opposed the followers of Jesus. So here's the first truth. Opposition doesn't mean you're wrong. It actually means you're in good company. When we're talking about opposition to sharing your faith and sharing Jesus with others, opposition doesn't mean you're wrong. It means you're in good company. For example, Jesus was opposed, right? And he was right. He was bringing the truth. He had come to save the world. But still, the people opposed him to the point that they crucified him. Peter and John were opposed. They were just out there healing people, preaching the good news of eternal life. And so they were doing God's work God's way, and still they were opposed. They were put in jail. This is the first of many times they were put in jail. James, one of the other leading apostles, was eventually beheaded. Uh, Paul, the apostle who wrote much of the New Testament, was constantly, violently opposed He said over in uh, 2 Corinthians 11, he said he was beaten three times with rods. He was once stoned and left for dead. Like, just because you are being opposed, that does not mean you're wrong. Actually, if if you are doing God's work, God's way, with a right spirit, and you're opposed, you're in good company. All the great leaders of the faith were opposed. But... There's good news. Acts chapter 4, verse 13. The members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. So even though they violently opposed them, they see, hmm, something's going on here. For they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures, and yet they're out preaching to crowds of thousands. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. Now, I don't know about you. I want to be recognized as a person who's been with Jesus. I want people to be able to say something's different about you. You have a love that seems like it's not from this world. I want that to be what people say about me. They recognized him as men who had been with Jesus. So if you are sharing the good news, like these guys were, if you're sharing the good news, that, that if you put your faith in Jesus, he has eternal life for you. He has salvation from your sins and forgiveness, and he can redeem your past. If you're sharing that good news with others, you can expect to be opposed. Praise the Lord. Right now in our country, we're not really seeing a necessarily physical opposition Uh, from people. Uh, There's opposition in a lot of other ways, and I I pray that we'll never get to that point where we're actually experiencing that. But our brothers and sisters around the world are actually experiencing all of that and more. You can expect to be opposed if you're doing God's work. Amen? Amen? Amen. Not too many amens on that. I'm just preaching the word today. As I was preparing this, I thought, hmm, do I bring this? And then I just felt like God said, do you want to bring the truth? And so I'm bringing the truth to you today, all right? I hope, I hope we can all, hope we can all uh, get something from this. Sometimes you might think that if you're suffering, you must be doing something wrong. You might think if you're sick or you have this struggle or that struggle, finances are hard or relationships are hard, you might, you might think, oh, it's probably because I'm a sinner. I'm bad. God is against me. That is not the case. If you're doing God's work God's way, he is for you. If you put your faith in God, he is for you. God wants you to prosper and be blessed. But we live in a world where there's opposition. That's just the truth. So I want to just encourage you, if you are experiencing hardship of any kind, I want to just encourage you, would you think this way? Wow, 
I must be getting closer to God, and the enemy's getting nervous. Isn't that a much better way to look at it? And that's why I say, just because you're experiencing hardship, that doesn't mean you're wrong or that you've sinned or that you're bad. It might actually mean you're on the right track. You're in good company with Peter, James, John, Jesus, Paul. You're in good company. God is for you, not against you. But there is opposition. And even in opposition, God works things for your good. He makes you stronger. He, he brings you closer to him. He's teaching you things. He's, he's causing you to dig into God's word. He's bringing good from it, even if you're experiencing opposition or hard times. And that's good news. Opposition doesn't necessarily mean you're wrong. It actually might mean you're in good company. <laughs> Here's the second truth I see. You don't have to be a big shot to make an, a big impact for Jesus. You don't have to be a big shot. You don't have to have a college degree in theology to share your faith with somebody else. God used these men that the Sadducees described as ordinary, unschooled men. He used them to shake up the world and to bring Jesus to the nations. It's pretty amazing. You don't have to have special religious training to make a difference in your world. So let's just take... Uh, their example and, and just follow their example. Just go press into Jesus' presence, press into God's presence, be with God until your life is changed, and it will be. If you, if you invest time in the presence of God, your life will be changed. Amen. And then go tell somebody. Yeah. That's all the qualifications you need. Just start there. You, you don't have to have a big platform. You don't have to have a, a degree. You don't have to have any of that. Just go be with God until he changes your life And then go tell somebody. Share your faith. Uh, It's so good that God doesn't call the equipped, they say. He equips the called. So just go and start, and God's going to build into you what you need. He doesn't just use the able. He uses the available. Be with God, and then go tell somebody about God. So we know from this story, the high council didn't know what to do with Peter and John. That's what they said. They're the smartest people in the land. They know everything about the Bible. The, the Old Testament is all they had at that point. They, they, uh, they know everything about the law and all of that stuff. And they said, we don't know what to do with this guy. Part of the reason is because the healed guy was standing right there. Uh, pretty, uh, pretty amazing how God caused all of that to work together. So what they did is they said, okay, we command you, Peter and John, to never speak of or teach in the name of Jesus again. Knock it off. That's what they were saying. Just knock it off. Quit talking about Jesus. Acts chapter 4, 19 and 20. But Peter and John replied, Do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? So he's talking about a choice. We don't just say, I, I, I don't obey red, you know, red lights, red traffic lights, because I believe God. No, that's, that's not how it works. But these people were telling them to stop speaking in Jesus' name. And they said, do you think that God, like, you know God. They're saying, they're talking to these guys, you know God. Do you really think he wants us to obey you rather than obey him? We cannot stop telling everyone, telling about everything we have seen and heard. We can't, we can't stop doing that. And if push comes to shove, church, we can't stop doing that. God is real. And no matter what opposition we face, we cannot stop telling people that Jesus saves, that Jesus is for you. Here's another truth I see in this story. Not everyone will choose to follow Jesus, but just share Jesus anyway. Jesus did not have a 100% salvation rate. I remember a rich young guy that came to him, and Jesus loved him. The Bible says he looked at him. He loved him. And the, the guy said, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, oh, wow, I love you. So I'm going to tell you the truth that you need to hear. Go sell everything you have. Come follow me, and you will have glorious treasure in heaven. And the guy said no to Jesus. <laughs> wow. So not everyone that you share Jesus with is going to choose him. But go share Jesus anyway. It's up to us to share. It's up to you to share. It's up to Jesus to save. And if I could just be slightly blunt, the person's got to make a teeny bit of effort. 
they got to say yes to Jesus. That's, that's, that's all they have. Not works to save them, but I'm just saying, like, you got to say yes to Jesus. Every, every, we have a part in receiving the salvation that he offers. Even though people around you see the power of God in your life, even though the people around you see the, the power of God as you're telling, man, this person was healed, this marriage was restored, as you're telling them about, even though they see all that good, there will still be some who refuse to believe. Tell them anyway. Share Jesus anyway. In, in, uh, we, uh, we see in the Bible kind of a peculiar reason, one reason why some people don't believe, and it's written in 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. Satan means the deceiver, the adversary, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ. And today, honestly, so many people are deceived. Why are they deceived? Because they have allowed the enemy and his thinking into their lives, and they've embraced it. So now they're walking in deception. Your responsibility is to share. Jesus' responsibility is to save. So how can we share? Well, one practical way is take an invite card and invite someone to Easter. I have found now, I've been doing this for the 12 years that we've been here. We came right before Easter, our very first time uh, when we came to this church. And from the very beginning, we've been inviting people to church on Easter. This past week when I, I was going through the drive through at Arby's, just a couple blocks away, and, and th this is something I say, and I, I just, I give this to you. Maybe this will, will help you. I, I get out this card, and I gave it to the, to the gal at the drive through and I said, I don't know if you have a church to go to for Easter, but I want to invite you to our church, Hope and Life Church. And you know what she did? She goes, she goes you're stupid. Get out of here. No, she didn't do that. You know what she did? She smiled and goes, oh, thanks. Just a young gal. Oh, thanks. Took it, and I, and I was on. On to, on to my next thing. Just let's, let's share Jesus. Let's invite them. Then whatever they do with that is up to them. So now what I'm doing, now I'm praying for those people I give it, I've given invite cards to. I'm praying for them. That God would show his love to them. That they would come and be a part of our church on Easter. And that, that God would just do something amazing in their lives. Our responsibility is to share. God's responsibility is to save. Now, if there's someone you're inviting and someone that you know, a coworker, a classmate, and a person from your extended family, then offer to pick them up. Yeah. Or if, if like you're early to, here early to serve or something, offer to meet them at a specific place. I'm going to meet you on the plaza where you're going to see a big, a big um, potted plant out there right in the middle of the plaza. I'm going to meet you at the potted plant at this such and such time. Or offer to go pick them up. Help people to get over that first difficult thing of going to a new place. Any new place is different. A difficult new restaurant, new store, new church. It's difficult. So let's bridge that gap. Let's make it easy for them to come to Jesus. Tell them your salvation story. Or tell them something God's done in your life recently. How he gave you peace uh, when you were struggling. How he healed uh, your body. Or whatever it is. Share Jesus. And, and we're going to leave the results with God. We're just going to do our part and share. Well, the council in the story threatened Peter and John. And they released them. The council was cautious at this point. We might see later on in a, in a later message, they were not always cautious. But at this point, they're just being cautious because they knew the crowds loved Peter and John. So when Peter and John were released, you would think, okay, we've been in jail. We've been drugged before the highest court of the land. You would think probably the first thing they would do when they got back to church was say to everybody, hey, you got to pray for us for protection. That's not what they prayed for. It's pretty amazing. In Acts chapter 4, 29 to 31, this is what they prayed. And now, O oh Lord, hear their threats. They threatened them. Don't you dare preach in Jesus' any, uh, name anymore or else there's going to be bad consequences. Hear their threats, O oh Lord, and give us, your servants, great boldness in preaching your word. Stretch out your hand with healing power. 
may miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And after this prayer, the meeting place shook. Okay, are you getting this? There was an earthquake spawned by this prayer. God was saying, I am here. I am hearing this prayer. Yes, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Not just Peter and John. Everyone gathered there, and then they preached the word of God with boldness. They prayed for boldness in preaching God's word, and they got out there, and they got bold. <laughs> and God's answer to their prayer was to refill them with the Holy Spirit. So they didn't pray for more Holy Spirit. They prayed for boldness in preaching. And God said, yes, the answer is I'm going to fill you again with the Holy Spirit. And many of these people had been baptized in the Holy Spirit, and God filled them again because they needed it for what, they, what was going on. And we, church, we need a fresh, ongoing Holy Spirit encounter and refilling in our lives. Are, are you afraid? You need the Holy Spirit. Are you timid in your witness? You need the Holy Spirit. Are you struggling? You need the Holy Spirit. You need to be refilled with the Holy Spirit so you're full of God. And it's Easter, and we've got friends, we've got coworkers, we've got classmates, we've got family members, we have neighbors that need to know about Jesus and that he offers them eternal life. Now, going back just a little further, a verse I didn't read, in verse 24, it says that when Peter and John were released by the authorities, all the believers lifted their voice together in prayer to God. And I already read what they prayed for. They prayed for boldness in preaching. Even though people were making threats, opposing them, they were being mocked and canceled. They, were, they, they prayed for healing power, miraculous signs and wonders to be done through the name of Jesus. That was their prayer. So this is what I want to do today. I want to ask you all to stand to your feet online. If you can, if you're not driving <laughs> and listening, or if you can, stand to your feet. Let's, let's stand. Let's, let's together as a church, let's pray. And let's, let's do the way, let's pray the way they prayed in the Bible. Let's all Lift our voices to God together, L using your voice out loud, the voice that could be heard by you and even the others around you. And in doing that, we encourage each other to pray. We hear someone else pray for a specific thing, and we go, yeah, that too, Lord. And we encourage each other. We encourage our faith. And there's something powerful, like earthquake powerful, that happens when the church all lifts their voices together in prayer. And I'm going to put up on the screen what they prayed for. Let's pray for these things and let's lift our voices. I'm not doing all the praying and you're doing the listening. Let's us pray together and I'll wrap it up in prayer. Okay, let's go. Let's do it. Let's lift our voices right now. Let's be loud. Let's encourage each other. Lord, I praise you, Lord God. Uh, we lift up our voices right now, Lord God. And Lord, we pray the way they prayed in the Bible, Lord God. But Lord, I pray for boldness. Lord God, I pray that I would be a bold witness. I pray that we would be bold witnesses, Lord God. That we would share you, Lord God, like never before, Lord God. Lord, I pray that this year at Easter, we would invite more people than we've ever invited before, Lord God. And that people would come and they'd find you, Jesus. Lord God, I pray, Lord God, that when they come, Lord God, that they would be healed and restored. Lord. Lord, I pray that as we go out to work and even to inviting, that you would do healings there. Lord, I pray that you do healings as we hand out those cards. Lord, I pray for signs and wonders. I pray for miracles to be done through the powerful and awesome name of Jesus Christ through us, Lord God. When we gather and when we scatter, Lord God, we pray for miraculous signs and wonders, Lord God. Lord, we praise you, Lord God. And Lord, we lift our voice. Lord God, we lift our voice in boldness, Lord God, in faith. Lord, we encourage each other in our faith and we ask you Lord for boldness in preaching not just for the pastor but for all of us I pray for a Holy Spirit infilling of boldness and power Lord God you have not given us a spirit of fear and of timidity but you've given us a spirit of power and love and a sound mind Lord God I pray for a refilling Lord God that would be unmistakable Lord in our midst in our church Lord God 
Fill us to overflowing with the Holy Spirit, I pray, with power, with faith, with miraculous signs and wonders following as we share you, Jesus. Lord, I pray, Lord, even if opposition comes, that we would stand strong and that we would share in love, that we would only speak the truth and only in love. Lord God, in Jesus' name, Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would do great things among us, not just so that we would be blessed, but so that you would be seen. Lord, I pray that you would be famous, that you would be famous in Auburn and in the Southeast Puget Sound region, that you would be famous, Lord, that, you, that we would make your name famous even around the world as people are tuning in and participating in online church. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name for a new day. I pray for a fresh infilling. I pray for an ongoing encounter with the Holy Spirit for me and for us, Lord God. Oh, we praise you, Lord. Oh, we praise you, Lord God. Did you pray in faith? Yeah. Then let's just clap our hands and say, Jesus, the answer's on the way. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I just declare that we are a people that are bold. We are a bold people. We are bold to invite. We are bold to witness. We are bold to share our faith. That's who we are. I speak that over us. I declare that this is a place and we are a people who believe in healing. We believe in healing and we pray until we see it. We are a people who, who believe in miraculous signs of wonders. And Lord God, I just declare over us that your wonders, your gifts are flowing through us. When we gather and when we scatter. Lord, I thank you, Lord. I praise you, Lord. I praise you, Lord. Let's stay in prayer. I've got one more invitation for you. Have you put your faith in Jesus? If you haven't yet, then I want to preach to you for just a minute. And I want to invite you, put your faith in Jesus. How do you do that? Turn away from your sins. Turn your life over to God and let him lead. You become an apprentice of Jesus Christ, studying his every move, imitating him, and then stepping out as he sends you into even greater things than ever have been seen before. With your heads bowed, I just want to ask you, would you like to put your faith in Jesus today? Would you like to become a Christian? If so, if you're in the room, would you raise your hand? And online, you can raise your hand to God, and he sees you right now. And I, I, if, you, if you're raising your hand, I want to just lead you in a prayer right now, coach you, and ask you just to repeat after me, but don't talk to me. Talk to Jesus, all right? And let's, let's all just, in, in unity, let's just pray this prayer together. We love praying this prayer. Let's go. Let's do it. Jesus. I invite you into my life. I acknowledge I'm a sinner. Please forgive me of my sin and make me new. I choose to follow you and be your apprentice starting now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, we welcome you. Hallelujah. I, I, I just want to ask you, we filled out connect cards earlier. If you prayed that prayer, would you be sure and check the box at the bottom so that I know you made that decision? Because I'm going to pray for you differently if you check that box and just encourage you in your new faith. God bless you, everybody. Amen. Praise God. Are you ready to be bold? I am. I'm just like, wow, how is God going to give us opportunities? We prayed for it. So let's expect it as we leave this place. Take those connect cards and look for those opportunities that we can invite somebody. I know God is going to honor that when we come to him asking. Amen? Amen. Well, we're going to get ready for tonight. We have Living Free happening. And uh, those of you who have been a part or haven't been a part yet, uh, I just want to invite you. Tonight we're starting a new section. Each, each uh, There's different sections. And tonight we're going to be learning about strongholds and how they're built and how we can be freed up. So, man, this is a great time to jump in there. So come on out tonight at 6 o'clock. Ushers, if you want to come right now and collect those connections, connect cards and you can just they'll, they're going to be just kind of available and you can hand those connect cards in so after service we're going to um, get this room ready for living free so any people that are available we're just going to be tearing down some of the chairs and putting tables up so there's two things I'm looking forward to seeing you at I'm looking forward to seeing you at living free tonight 
actually three things. I'm looking forward to seeing you on Saturday for our cleanup day. It's going to be super fun. I'm already starting to figure out what we're going to eat for lunch. And I'm always thinking ahead on that. And then next Sunday, let's get pumped up. Let's bring someone along with us and let's worship and honor God. Amen. Have a fantastic week and look for those opportunities. Amen.